Welcome back to College Football Addiction. I've got Christian Simmons from the Pegasus Podcast, Night Sports Now as well, talking all things UCF. And Christian, I want to get a bold prediction from you here in just a, mo- a minute, but I want to ask you about KJ Jefferson specifically. And I, I know there are Cam Ward comparisons, which I know are a little, in my opinion, a little bit crazy. Like, let's maybe tone that down, uh, you know, a tad. But I do think that KJ can be really, really good in Gus Malzahn's offense. I mean, you kind of saw what what he could do at, at Arkansas in a, in a couple of seasons up there for, you know, just not a very good team. What are the true expectations? What, what's the true ceiling for KJ this year? Well, I think that's, as all things, going to depend on who you ask. I think if you were to ask a casual UCF fan, the answer would be Heisman and first round draft pick, because I think UCF fans are very excited about KJ Jefferson coming in. But as far as realistic expectations, I think the main appeal of KJ, I don't think anyone necessarily thinks that he's going to be the best quarterback of the Big 12 or one of the top five quarterbacks in college football. It's more about the fit. As long as Gus Malzahn has been at UCF, it's been the struggle to find a quarterback that actually fits what he likes to do. He started out with Dylan Gabriel, who obviously is a very different type of quarterback. Then it was Mikey Keene, who was a true freshman, isn't very mobile. Then they went to John Rice Plumley, who checks the mobility boxes, but not so much the decision-making and passing boxes. And this feels like the first time since he's been here that they really have the perfect quarterback for his system. Someone who's accurate, someone who's huge, someone who can be mobile and improvise. So the expectations are that this is kind of which it's funny because it's year four of the Gus era, but it kind of feels like this is the first time we're really going to see his ideal offense exactly exactly as he's wanted to run it here. So the expectations are high, but we just kind of have to wait and see what happens. Um, if you had to rank the four quarterbacks in the in the state of Florida, the four power four quarterbacks, I'll, I guess I'll not leave anybody <laughs> out, but the four power four quarterbacks in the state of Florida, where's KJ slot in for you? USF fans are shouting about Byron Brown right now, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> I, it's, I think he's going to be fine. You know, I know UCF fans don't want to hear that if they're tuning in. I think he's going to be fine. <laughs> I, I do think there's a, a pretty clear cutoff, though. For sure. I mm, This is tough. I'm afraid to say any of this publicly. I think <laughs> I'd probably put Cam Ward number one. Yeah. Um, I Listen, th- there's a case that KJ could be considered number two by the end of the season. I know that DJU is interesting. I, I'm not big on Graham Mertz. I will see if he's still um, the quarterback. Maybe I'd be by the time that UCF's going up there to play uh, Florida. But yeah, so I think number two could be fair potentially as a ranking. Yeah, I think I think it's TBD. Yeah, I, I'd probably put Cam Ward first. You know, I think Graham Mertz for what he does is fine. I, you know, Graham Mertz isn't going to win you a lot of games. Probably not going to lose you a lot of games. You know, sure. and so DJ probably will win you some games and and probably lose you some. You know, like he'll probably be that kind of guy. And then yeah, I think KJ. You know, kind of the same thing. Like you could flip flop two or three, and by about week four, you know, we should we should have a pretty good idea. Um, What what do you think about trench play at UCF? First year in the Big 12 last year. How do you think they stacked up and how do you think they kind of look this year coming up? Well, uh, yeah, that was obviously UCF moving from AAC to Big 12. That was going to be a big topic of discussion was the you know line play. And honestly, the O-line was such a strange situation last year because they ended up having to reconfigure it. I mean, I, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head of how many individual O-lines they started, but it was a lot. There were a lot of different configurations, moving guys around to different positions. And it was honestly fine for all the concerns of how you know line play was going to impact them. They're really it wasn't a giant, giant issue on either side of the ball on defense. The real issue became linebackers and just refusal to stop the run. And it kind of became the situation where if the runner makes it past the D line, there is literally no one who was going to stop him. But for all the concerns about depth there and, and listen, the depth is still somewhat of a concern. I, I think that there are on offensive line going into this year, they've probably got three guys, maybe four guys in solid places right now. There's they don't really necessarily have an awesome option for right tackle in particular. So we'll see if they get creative kind of trust Herb Hand, the offensive line coach, to figure that out. And defensive line is, they've got some really good guys, particularly at D-tackle, guys like John Walker, guys like Lee Hunter. John Walker, who, you know, was a true freshman last year, and he's kind of been there, maybe the most prized recruit for UCF ever. He was a top 100 player. Florida really went after him. They got him on campus a week before signing day, and I think UCF fans kind of threw up their hands in defeat, but then he stuck with UCF and signed, and they're hoping he'll have a big year this year. So it's been a mixed bag. It's they need more depth there, but it wasn't necessarily a disaster or something where, oh man, they just can't compete at these spots. What about the rest of the defense? The Big 12, not necessarily known for a lot of defense, but how, how does UCF stack up just generally defensively in the Big 12? Well, it's kind of funny because Gus Malzahn's talked about a few times that he sort of bought into that uh, idea of the Big 12's not big on defense, maybe a little too much. And he's talked about how they got into the league and were like, oh, wait, no, they're actually playing defense. That's 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 tough. But yeah, UCF's defense, I mean, it was 
to put it very politely, it was a train wreck last season. They got in <laughs> to Big 12 play, mm-hmm. and first game, they go on the road to K-State, they give up 44 points. They come back home against Baylor, they go up 35-7, then they lose 36-35. They then go on the road to Kansas and give up 51 points. All said, they gave up 30-plus points six times, and like I said, the big issue was just stopping the run. They quite literally could not stop the run, and when you're in a league where everyone has a star running back, that is not an ideal problem to have. So the defense, it's kind of felt like they're starting from square one this year. They brought in a new defensive coordinator in Ted Roof, and they went so portal heavy on defense. I think there's a very real chance that six or seven of the starters on defense were going to end up, end up having being brought in in this portal cycle, and that's at virtually every position. I know they're really excited about Deshaun Pace, who they brought in from Cincinnati. He was one of the few Cincinnati standouts last year. He'll probably start at linebacker. They're really hyped about Ladarius Tennyson. He comes in from Ole Miss and is one of those guys that you know, it wasn't a huge priority for Ole Miss, but wasn't someone that they kicked off. They weren't thrilled to see him go. And he's someone who's played some linebacker for them, some safety. I think UCF probably sees him as more of a safety. There's just, I mean, I really, it's, it's, and there, and there are some guys coming back from last year who were standouts. I talked about the defensive line and there's, there are guys like um, Damari Henderson at safety. He won national defensive player of the week against Oklahoma state last year. So they had some pieces, but they understood that offense was okay. Defense just, it was not a power five defense, power four defense, whatever we're calling it these days. And they know they have to, they have a lot of work to do to get there this year. On the offense side of the ball, you know, excluding KJ, who is, you know, maybe the most, (laughs) the most electric, the most exciting at at times, you know, we'll see this year. Um, Who is, who is a standout offensively that the average fan should kind of keep their eyes on running back wide receiver, wherever you want to look at at the skill position. 100% 100% going to be RJ Harvey, the running back. He's coming off a 1,400 yard, 16 touchdown season. He's got that hometown hero label for UCF. He initially went to Virginia and transferred back, Virginia and, and transferred back to UCF a few years ago. And he's had a couple really big years for them. And what's cool about RJ Harvey is he's, since Mackenzie Milton played here in 2018, RJ Harvey is definitely the player the fans have most embraced as a star. He's kind of that. It, it's funny. I know nationally it's more KJ, but locally it's more RJ Harvey's the face of the program right now. He's the guy on the billboards and posters. He's the guy that fans love because he's just sort of, I mean, I, part of it is in modern college football, it's rare to see a guy going into year three of being a high level producer on your team, especially at UCF. So he's just sort of built up that reputation and uh, everyone's hoping he can have a huge year. I'm sure he will. And what's kind of funny is on top of him, you're returning a 1400 yard rusher. They also went to the portal and got another 1400 yard rusher. They brought in Penny Boone from Toledo who put up 1400 yards and 15 touchdowns last season. And they complement each other kind of perfectly. RJ is more of that patient, fast running back and Penny's more of a bruiser. So just that, that combo is going to be really, really interesting to watch how they use them because then you combine them with KJ and that's a team that can potentially pick up a lot, a lot of yards on the ground. We joked about this and laughed about it uh, right before we started recording, but uh, seven and a half Vegas uh, over under win total, which I'll, I'll give my perspective as an outsider. If, if UCF was to get to eight, you know, in a very um, evenly, dis- um, a very even big 12, I, I actually think that'd be pretty good. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's three big 12 losses and a loss at UF, which I, you know, UCF fans aren't going to love, or it's, you know, split your, split your games in the big 12 and beat you Florida. Um, What are your thoughts on, you know, where the fan base would sit with eight? Do they really need to try and get up to nine for people to be happy uh, with the expectations around KJ and RJ and and, and different folks there? What are your thoughts on the win total? Well, this is the fun part of the offseason where we're right before the season and all 134 teams believe that this is their year and they're going to go far and they're going to win all their games. But the honest truth from a UCF, not from what I necessarily expect to happen perspective, but from a fan base perspective is the expectation is they need to win the big 12 or play for the big 12 title. And if you're not a UCF fan, that probably sounds ridiculous to you. If you are a UCF fan, there's some of you where that also sounds ridiculous to you, but that is very much the expectation. It's been in the Malzahn era. It's always been one or two steps away from what they were supposed to be in 2022. They went nine and five. They were a win away from hosting the AAC title game and lose. They're a win away from winning the AAC and going to the cotton bowl and they lose. And Last season felt like more of that when they blow the Baylor game, when they have a third quarter lead over K-State and can't close out, when they lose to Oklahoma by two. So fans are ready for another 2017-2018 type season. If that matches with reality, I don't know. But the internal expectations from the fan base and even what the team has been putting out is, is very much about they need to be one of the best programs in the Big 12. I think that for this to be a considered a successful season by the fan base, they need to either win at Florida or play for the big 12 title. One of those two things has to happen or it's going to be a messy season and messy off season for the fan base. Yeah. The uh, big 12 does feel so wide open. And so I feel like they could, I mean, they could do that. Right. But they, you know, it's so tough to project when so many games are going to be 
you know, yeah. coin flips. It's hard to think. I mean, you usually win the games you're supposed to win and lose the games you're supposed to lose, right? And then, you know, when there's seven coin flips, it's hard to go six and one in those or, or seven and oh. I mean, typically you're going four and three or three and four, right? Like that's just what, mo you know, unless you're Georgia. Right. And if you're Georgia, you just have less coin flips. So, um, all right, what's your, uh, what's your bold prediction? What's your hottest take for UCF this year? You've been really well. You've been really well measured on this, so we gotta we gotta splice, splice this up a little bit. D d doing what I can. Listen, it's <laughs> it's it's been interesting times. It's whenever you, I, I personally felt like six and seven was an acceptable first season in the Big Twelve, and UCF fans did not. So I'm trying to kind of toe the line in between. But my absolute bold hot take is that I do genuinely think they can go to the Big Twelve title game this year, and I think they can win it. And what's crazy is, I guess that if you want to put the hottest label on it, it's that that's UCF going to the playoff now. So I guess my hot take is I think UCF absolutely can go to the playoff. I think what's interesting is that they've built the roster. Right. Like, I really do think on paper what we know now, you have to see them play, but it feels like they have built a roster that can compete for the Big 12. They've brought in a ton of, they have a lot of incredible weapons on offense. The offense should be no problem. The defense was such a mess last year, but this feels like a completely turned over defense. It feels like we can't even compare it to last year's unit. If those guys play well and live up to the expectations, this team on paper can absolutely win the Big 12. The tricky part is UCF is one of genuinely probably nine Big 12 fan bases saying the exact same thing right now. This is our year we're going to win the Big 12, but... I like parts of UCF schedule. I like that they don't have to have any crazy road trips except for out to Arizona State. There was a concern when because they, they do play all four Pac-12 schools, but they luckily get um they get a lot of them at home. I, the schedule sets up pretty nicely. It, it just seems like a situation where there's an opportunity for things to break their way. It really does feel like the cards are set up in a way where it doesn't mean it's going to happen, but they don't have major major obstacles in their way where you kind of have to throw up your hands before the season's even started. Christian, where can people follow you? Where can they find your work? Yes, yeah, so you can check us out on the Pegasus podcast. That's available pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts. You can find me on Twitter at by C.A. Simmons. And you can check us out at nightsportsnow.com as well. Awesome. Thanks, man. Definitely.